Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, May the 7th, 2021. It is currently 1045 a.m. Central Central Time. Yes, if I can speak correctly. It is Friday, May the 7th, 2021. It is currently 1045 a.m. Central Time, and I'm here at Victory Baptist Church located in Ovalo, Texas, and I'm going to ask that you you be patient with me this morning. I'm, I'm going to ask that you give me a little bit of liberty, okay? Now, I know when you sit in front of a microphone and you go live that you are supposed to have everything, you know, really planned out. You should, you should already know what you're going to say, how you're going to say it. It's really mapped out. It's, it's outlined. You've, you've got a plan. But this morning, I don't really have it mapped out. I don't really have a plan, so I'm going to ask that you be patient with me, and let me try to explain what I'm doing. I can't can't speak for you, but for me, throughout my entire Christian life, I am constantly will hear something mentioned, you know, a a scripture mentioned, or we'll hear a sermon, or I'll read something in in a book, or maybe read something in a systematic theology. I'll just come across something, and it will spark hours and hours of just meditation and just taking the thought and just going over it over and over and over and over and over again, all kinds of different ways. And sometimes after days of just trying to take it apart, maybe when it's all said and done, I don't feel like I I have any real answers or come to any real good conclusions. But I believe that entire process, even though I don't really, I may not have anything at the end to show for it, like, oh, look, look, I came to this amazing conclusion or look what I discovered. I may not have anything tangible to say all of those hours spent was worth it, but I still believe all of those hours that were spent was worth it because I was spending hours meditating on God's word, thinking about, you know, maybe a theological topic or a passage of scripture, whatever the case may be. And so I think the process is still beneficial. Even when it's all said and done, we don't necessarily have something very like, you know, here's the three points I learned. Here's, I may not have anything very specific that that I can point to, but the process was still profitable. Now, the reason I tell you that is because I don't know where we're going to end with this, all right? We may not end with anything. When this is all said and done, you may not like, you may not be like, wow, that was really awesome. Never thought about it that way. That was really powerful because I may not have any dramatic conclusion. So hopefully, just the process of me basically turning on the microphone and thinking out loud and trying to process something that I heard in a sermon that is also found in the book of Acts, I hope that that will ultimately benefit you greatly. I I hope the process will benefit you greatly, and hopefully it will spark you then to spend some hours working on it and thinking about it. Now, if you've been keeping up with the TheologyCentral.net blog, you will notice I I posted a voice memo kind of giving you this kind of throwing out some of these thoughts that I was having. I've spent more time with it now, and I, I'm still, I'm still trying to tr- trying to work it out. I'm there, there's really two things going on. There's a passage in Acts, and there's a passage I believe in. Is it Second Peter? I believe it's Second Peter. It may be First Peter. Um, that I have been really just trying to to work on and work on. You've heard me discuss the passage in Peter. Um, in the series, The Christian in Complete Armor. If you haven't, you should go listen to the last, I think, two episodes where I really start taking that apart. And I'm going to be returning to that maybe in a sermon. Then I, uh, I, there's a passage in, Act, in the book of Acts that I have now spent days with trying to figure it out. So I'm going to use this time to get to the Acts passage. But I'm going to take you through the process. I'm going to take you through the process and how I first heard what, you know, obviously I've read the book of Acts multiple, multiple, multiple times, but how this particular passage, actually it's an entire chapter plus, how this chapter 
plus, because it goes into the next chapter as well, how this was kind of brought back to my attention. And it was, and it was just one of those comments made in a sermon, really in passing. In other words, it wasn't, it wasn't the primary focus of the sermon. They weren't trying to exegete the passage. They weren't even trying to pay, I don't even think they uh, read from the passage. They just made a reference to it. And once they made a reference to it, in fact, I stopped listening to the sermon right then, went and grabbed my Bible, and then started looking at the section, and then that just sparked all of these thoughts. So I'm going to take you through the entire process. But let's begin with a definition, right? Let's begin with a definition, all right? Now, even though I don't have this outlined, I'm going to try my best to take you through a logical progression of thought. I'm going to try. I don't know if I'm going to accomplish that, but I'm going to try, all right? Here we go. Discernment. Discernment is the ability to obtain sharp perceptions or to judge well or the activity of so doing. So discernment is the ability to obtain sharp perceptions or to judge well. In other words, discernment is you have this ability to really have this perception of, okay, wait, I think this is, this is right. This is wrong. You have the ability to judge. Um, I have a quote here from, supposedly it's from Charles Spurgeon. I don't know if it's true. It says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Right now, that's that's interesting. The point there is discernment goes beyond just the ability to know right and wrong. It's the ability to know even the very difference between right and almost right. It's the difference between knowing right and almost wrong. In other words, discernment is this ability to really be able to perceive the reality of the situation, to really be able to understand what is right and what is wrong. It is the ability maybe to even be able to perceive to discern. Now, you cannot discern other people's motives because now you're trying to judge something you can't, but being able to discern even your own motives. Discernment. Now, here's the question. If you look at the American church right now, no, no, you know, let me take that back. Strike, Strike that. Forget the American church. If you look at the average individual Christian, forget the church. Average individual Christian that either you go to church with or you may just know on social media. You just know them. They profess to be a believer. You profess to be a believer. They, they believe the basic, you know, r- hopefully correct doctrines about Christianity. Yeah, and, uh, enough that you could say, okay, yeah, I believe that there be a, to be a Christian. But other Christians that you know, if you were to judge their level of discernment, one or zero being like none, it doesn't exist. They have no discernment. And 10, being an extremely discerning person, where would you rate them between a zero and 10? And just think about not only just individuals, just Christians that you know. And then when you're done considering everyone else, then go look in the mirror and then look at that person that's staring back at you. Where would you rate their discernment? A zero or a 10? Now, I think this is a very important time to ask this question because if we've watched what's happened within Christianity, you could really go back, and I know this is always, I I state this as a major turning point in American Christianity, but I think a lot did change between around 2015 leading to the the election of Trump, uh, 2016 through the entire Trump administration, even all the way to the present. I think that there are a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, have looked at the American Christianity, looked at individual Christians, and looked at the church and asked, where is your discernment? How are you thinking? How are you making this decision that this is right and this is wrong? And then looked at how Christians have handled COVID, how Christians have handled things like uh, the election, Listen to things Christians have said. Clearly, in many cases, it's been easy to demonstrate that they've just given absolute fraudulent information, misinformation, conspiracy theories, just crazy ideas with no actual proof and just throwing out claims. You have to ask, where is the discernment? Then you look at the theological chaos in the American church. Where is the discernment? You look at decisions of Christians that you know they make in regards to their family, their marriage, 
whatever. Where is their discernment? So a lot of people have spent a lot of time talking about the lack of discernment in American American Christianity. Now, while you're sitting there rating it and judging it, let me ask you a question. How much discernment should a Christian have and how does a Christian get said discernment? Now, I think you would say, oh, well, we should, we should be the most discerning people. Well, then how do you develop that discernment? Is it something just supernaturally given? How do we obtain it? So a lot of questions in regards to discernment. And the reason I started thinking about this idea of discernment, and I'm going to do some teaching on it, I believe, at some point. This is going to, this is going to develop into something more. I just need, I need more church services. I need more time. But because some, some things I don't, some things I like, I have no problem coming here and sitting in front of a microphone in an empty building talking about. And there's other times I don't want to be in an empty building in front of a microphone. I want to be in front of the actual people of the church and really engaging them on this subject. And I think discernment is something that we, we need to talk about more. And, and I've talked about it in the past, so this is nothing new, but we're going to approach it from this direction. So here's what happened. Um, as you know, I use the Edify Christian Podcast app, and I'm on there hour after hour, just looking for anything and everything, trying to tell me what's going on within Christianity, listening to things for my own spiritual encouragement, and to just listen to things to go where I can exercise discernment to go, okay, is that a good sermon? Is that, is that a bad sermon? If you just, if you listened to uh, recently our little mini series on Zechariah chapter 12, we reviewed a sermon found on the Edify Christian podcast app, which just doing a search. And I'm telling you, you need to exercise discernment in listening to that sermon because that thing was a train wreck of epic proportions. The way they handled Zechariah chapter 12 is almost criminal in my estimation. But that's why we do those kinds of things because you've got to exercise that discernment. All right? I think there's a way you have to obtain it, but I think the way you I think one of the ways you truly obtain it is you have to engage in an exercise. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But here was this on, on the Edify Christian podcast app. I think it was Monday. Uh, they were like, hey, this week we're going to, uh, um, for, for this podcast that I, list, that I was listening to, they announced that for this entire week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they were going to take five sermons from a pastor who has passed away. Uh, he, he's no longer currently living on this earth, uh, but he, he has passed away. But they were going to take five of his sermons that he preached at a conference on discernment. And I'm like, okay, that that sounds like an interesting week of, of broadcasting. Let me let me tune in and listen to this. Well, I haven't made it through all five. In fact, I haven't even made it through through the first one because the first one, in a passing comment, the pastor mentions something in regards to the book of Acts. What we're going to do is we're going to start with part. We're going to start with the first sermon in this series. We're going to start listening, and when he gets to that section of scripture. And when he throws out that comment, we're going to stop, consider his comment, and then go to the passage of Scripture in question and see what we can learn in regards to discernment and see how we should actually interpret this. So hopefully all of this sounds good. Are you ready? Here we go. I'm just going to start this right at the beginning, and I may, I may break in at some different points and throw in some comments, but let's go. So get your mind thinking. Discernment. Right? I've asked you some questions. I want you to consider this idea of discernment. How discerning are you? Well, let's discern what this pastor has to say in regards to discernment. And then let's try to discern if Acts 20, well, I'll give you the chapter in a minute. If in the book of Acts and this section of scripture that is referenced, is this about discernment? Is this a lesson about discernment? Right? Here we go. You're listening to the Today in the Word radio podcast. This week, we bring you five messages the late Vance Hafner presented during a church conference on discernment. Vance Hafner was a pastor, author, and evangelist from North Carolina. Now, here is Vance Hafner on Today in the Word radio. As has been announced already, beginning tonight, the Lord willing, we want to thank together for the rest of this conference on the subject of discernment. There are five verses, or really six, one about the Word of God being a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That applies to all the other five, so I sort of uh, uh, make it an auxiliary to all of them. 
We will be thinking about discerning the truth, discerning the times, discerning the spirits, discerning the Lord's body, and discerning good and evil. Tonight, discerning the truth. In all these years, I have never seen so much bewilderment and confusion and uncertainty as plagues the Church today, even evangelical Christianity. I've never seen so many preachers and Christians in general shaking their heads and wringing their hands and saying, I don't know what to think about this, and I can't make up my mind about that, and I can't decide what's true and what's false. We've developed a tolerance and a permissiveness and an acceptance and an acquiescence that was unthinkable only a few years ago. I like to read sometimes what one great preacher says about another, and this is what Joseph Parker said about Spurgeon. The only colors Mr. Spurgeon knew were black and white. With Mr. Spurgeon, you were either up or down, in or out, alive or dead. As for middle zones and graded lines and light compounded with shadow, in a graceful exercise of give and take, he only looked on them as heterodox and the implacable enemies of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Well, evidently, Mr. Spurgeon uh, knew what he believed and knew where he stood. And today, in this Laodicean age, when we're neither cold nor hot, we've been brainwashed into a pleasant middle-of-the-roadism, trying to be neither nor in a world that's either or. Middle of the roaders, but the middle of the road's a poor place to drive, poor place to walk, poor place to be any time. Then we've had two wars that we neither won nor lost. That's strange for American history. Paul Harvey said we were afraid to win them and ashamed to lose them. But Douglas MacArthur said there is no substitute for victory, and that still holds. There is no peaceful coexistence with communism or the devil. It's like cancer. If you don't get the cancer, the cancer will get you. And uh, it seems to me, beloved, that we ought to know where we stand. We are not of the night or of darkness if we're Christians. We have a Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the testimony of the Church. We have the witness of history. We have our hope, sanctified common sense. And if we're lot, with all that we don't know, who does? We lack a very rare ingredient in evangelical Christianity, discernment. Now, there are several words that mean almost the same thing. We say... And we got to stop right there. First of all, one of the great things of living in the world, living at the time in which we all live, is one of the great things we have is we have technology. And with that technology, we can use it to waste a lot of time. We can use it to do a lot of bad things. We can, uh, we can use it to hurt other people or to hurt ourselves. Or we can use it to take advantage of what has been given to us. That little phone in your hand, you have the ability to listen to sermons from almost any, I mean, as long as they've been recorded, you have the ability to listen to them. Sermons from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, sermons from, you know, all different backgrounds. You have the ability. You have the ability to read sermons from back before there was any recording device. You have the ability to read the church fathers. You have all of that at your fingertips. And when you take the time to use that technology for good, well, you can stumble across a sermon like this. We don't know. I don't know when it was preached. We don't have a year. He mentions things like Paul Harvey. He mentions, uh, clearly he, he's mentioning Vietnam and North Korea, or the Korean War. I should say the Korean conflict in Vietnam. Um, he's, that seems to me he's making a reference to that. So I don't know, you know, was this the 70s? Was this the 80? I don't know when this was preached, but it's just interesting that even going that far back, whenever this was, guess what? He's saying, hey, the church lacks discernment. The church lacks discernment. We're in a, he, he kind of refers to we're in the middle of a road age where everybody just wants to be in the middle of the road. Nobody wants to be, you know, one or the other. We're, we we you know, basically are lukewarm. Uh, we're not hot nor cold. There's just kind of this apathy complacency. Nobody wants to define truth because you don't want to offend any, anyone else. And that he's saying that's kind of the spirit of the age, even the way uh, America handled those wars. We were, you know, like I said, um, 
and what, af- uh, afraid to uh, win them or ashamed to lose them. I can't remember exactly how he made that uh, that statement. And so he's really, it's just interesting that, 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 that he's describing the spirit of the age and that spirit of the age was, had crept into the church. Well, if that was true, whenever this was preached, where are we in 2021 when it comes to discernment? And I think if we go back in church history, this is very important. I think if we go back in church history, you're always going to find sermons from preachers arguing and or not arguing, declaring, announcing the lack of discernment within Christianity. Why is that such a common theme? Now, do either we have it or we don't. Now, he seemed to kind of imply that, that because we have the Holy Spirit that we should have it, but clearly just having the Holy Spirit does not give people spiritual discernment, clearly. Because again, if we if the Holy Spirit gives you some kind of supernatural spiritual discernment, then everyone, then everyone would be able to discern whether their doctrine they hold to is true or false. Therefore, Christians would be unified in doctrine because we all have the Holy Spirit and we would all have the discernment to go, that doctrine's not true, that doctrine's not true, that doctrine's not true. But clearly, that doesn't happen. So what discernment do we have? And if we do have it, how do we develop it? All right, let's continue. Distinguish or differentiate or discriminate, but I think the best word is discern. A lot of difference between uh, guessing at a matter and presuming. When Paul started toward Rome on that uh, ill-fated, if you want to use such a term, uh, trip, by sea, I read that the captain of the ship said everything would be lovely, but Paul said there would be a storm. And they listened to the mariner instead of to the minister. They listened to the skipper instead of to the seer and sailed away to shipwreck. And today we're listening to the skipper, the expert. He ought to know. I'm sure some of the passengers on that boat must have said, well, what would a preacher know about navigation? That's the business of the captain of the ship. So away they went to a storm. And we read that the more part in your King James said, well, let's go. It says Paul perceived and the rest of them presumed. And when the south wind blew softly, and that's the sort of wind that's blowing today pretty generally uh, over the land in, in some ways, they sailed away to shipwreck. You see, the uh, expert thought he knew and didn't. That's the trouble with experts. Somebody said if you laid all of them in a row, you never would reach a conclusion. I believe that's a pretty fair description. And these uh, discussions on television, don't they just wear you down? These experts get together, you know, and have a symposium. That's where we pool our ignorance. And they decide what's the matter with this and what's the matter with that. Had one the other day on alcoholism. Never said a word about alcohol. You know, I may be a country preacher, but I have always thought that the real trouble with alcoholism was alcohol. I think I thought that's what caused it. But then I'm not an expert. <clears throat> now, uh, discernment is just about the scarcest commodity in the church today. The first. Now, stop right here. Okay. Now, you see, it was just in passing. He mentioned the Apostle Paul, and that while everybody else was presuming what they should do, Paul was perceiving what they should do, that the experts in sailing, the experts in navigation, they presumed what to do and they would not listen to the preacher or the minister. They would not listen to him. And the minister was able to perceive through the use of discernment what they should do and what was coming while everyone else said, no, we're going to listen to the experts. And the experts were was wrong, but the preacher was right. The experts were wrong, but the preacher was right. Well, how is that? The question is, is that the way, is that the way it should be? Because it's definitely not the way it is. It's definitely not that when, when you look at Christianity and I, there's the experts on this side, here's the Christians on the other. I'm sorry. There are a lot of times I don't know if I want to listen to the Christians. But then there are other situations where, okay, maybe the Christians have it right. So he says, you know, discernment, he, he went on to say, is, you know, like a rare commodity in the church at that time. I don't know what year that was. It was a rare commodity. Well, if it was rare then, 
It's even more rare now. How do we get it? What do we do? And how should we interpret what happened in Acts and end the book of Acts? Now, the story he's referencing is in Acts chapter 27, all right? In Acts chapter 27, all right? Now, I've got multiple Bibles here. Um, we may, we're may we going to work through this. I don't know. I, I, I'm... I'm debating on whether we should do this or not, but we're going to do this, all right? I don't know how far we're going to get, but we're going to see because it's just, he just makes the story. Like he's talking about discernment and he just makes this passing reference. And it just, once he made the passing reference, I'm like, okay, is Acts 27 telling us anything about discernment? I guess you could argue there is some discernment happening in the text, but what, can we take anything from it? So let's, Let's, uh, let's just see what we can do here. Now, first, first thing we have to realize, when we come to Acts 27, we have a historical narrative. We have a historical narrative. So first and foremost, this is here simply to give us a description of what happens. We got to be very careful in trying to draw some major conclusion that this is prescribing some clear understanding of discernment. It may serve as an example. Now, we know this, even though it's a historical narrative, And even though its primary purpose is to describe what happened, we know that all scripture is given by by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So there is something profitable here. We'll have to try to figure out what is going on. So are you ready? Acts chapter 27. Now, this is going to name a lot of places, a lot of names. Um, I'm going to try to do my best to make sure I pronounce them correctly. Always make sure you verify. Um, And um, I want to back this story because there's a temptation to just jump ahead, but I don't want to jump ahead. Some people would just want to get to when they have the discussion, when Paul says, hey, this is what is going to happen. And then how it all unfolds and how the ship, you know, the shipwreck occurs. There's a temptation to jump to that. But I think if we jump to that, we may miss something. All right. Because something very interesting occurs here, all right? So Acts chapter 27, all right? Here we go. Acts chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was determined that we should sell into Italy, they delivered Paul and a certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band, all right? So this is very important. So we have, we have a decision being made that they're going to sell into Italy, they're going to uh, they're going to deliver they're going to obviously Paul and, and other prisoners unto one named Julius a centurion of Augustus's band they entered into the ship of Adramitium we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia one Aristarchus a Macedonian of Thess- Thessalonica being with us so here's just giving us a lot of the basic information but i want you to realize they're going to set out and they are headed to they're going to sail into Italy that's where they're selling. There's a, a, some different people who are here. We've got a prisoner. We got all of the different things going on. Then in verse three, and the next day we touched at Sidon and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So that sounds like they started selling. They made it, uh, they sold an entire day. And the next day they uh, touched at Sidon. Now, we'd have to look at a map to go how far did they make it. But in other words, selling is occurring. This is what I want you to see. Selling is occurring. They're involved in their journey, and no one is making any, no one is mentioning any concerns about a a storm, about a possible shipwreck. Everyone is just going along with it. I think that's very important to the story, right? Because again, if you just jump down to where Paul's like, hey, guys, there's a problem, I think that that we that loses its impact because there's been sailing going on prior to that. In fact, we're going to follow it all the way through. Okay, so verse four, and when and when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. All right, so then they they continue to to sail, but now the winds are contrary. The winds are are causing a, um, a problem. So they go to Cyprus. All right. Uh, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. All right. 
Now, so they continue to sell. That's the main thing. They continue to sell. I mean, I I could try to tell you about each part and go through all of this, but the point is they are continuing to sell. And guess what you have here? No warning, nobody perceiving. You would argue that everyone is presuming that they're just going to make it to their destination because obviously – I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise. I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise. But when you go and you, first you drive up and they take your baggage and then you go park and then you, you, know, you come back to, to go through all the security where you can finally get on the boat when you go through all of that. And you get on that boat and then, you know, you do your safety drill. Okay, all right, you, get, you do your safety drill. Then you get back and then typically you want to run up on, you know, on deck where you can watch the boat pull, pull out. Um, that's always fun. Uh, when we pull out of uh, – whenever we uh, go on a cruise and we leave Galveston here in Texas, it's always fun because there's these dolphins that are right there that usually try to follow the, the ship out. And it's always fun to watch them. So, But you go up there and guess what? As that boat is pulling out – you are completely under, I mean, there, there's no thought in your mind that the boat's not going to retor- return to that exact same port that you just left. You know that, hey, whatever the crew, if you're on a five-day cruise, seven-day cruise, whatever it is, it's going to come back. You, you, just, you just know that. You, that. you are presuming that. Clearly, I think everyone on the boat, including Paul at this time, just presumes that hey, we, we are going to become, we're going to make it to Italy, all right? Um, verse six, and there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria selling into Italy and he put us there in. So they, they're, they're, they uh, have made it to a certain area. Then they find a ship that's going to, to Italy. Remember, that's where they're, they're headed. And he puts them in verse seven. And when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce were come over against, uh, Sinaitis, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against, uh, Sal- Salmoni. All right. So they're again, they're they're sailing. And you could argue they've had some difficulties with some of the winds, some of the, the, the situations that are happening here. But again, there's no warning about a storm or a shipwreck. Again, the idea is, OK, we're, we may be facing some difficulty, but the assumption is, you know, again, using the language from that sermon, they, they're just presuming. Right. One perceived one was presuming, I think, is, is how he said. Um, I think that's how he said it. Uh, but the idea is that hey, we're we're the you know the presumption is that we're going to make it. We're, we're going to make it. That that's the idea from everyone involved. All right. Uh, next, let's see what verse verse eight. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now, when much time was spent, and when selling was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Now, I think verse 9 is a very important verse. I think verse 9 is a very important verse because verse 9 seems to imply that something had changed and what had changed, think of it this way, the seasons had changed. The seasons had changed because it says when, um, I find this, the fast was now already passed. The fast was now already passed. What is that referring to? What is that referring to? Now, again, if we're going to use discernment to interpret this text, we have to start right here. So let's just look something up really quick. I think I already know the answer, but I'm just going to verify my answer because I think this is uh, 100% correct. Go to, I'm just go to Acts 27.9. I'm going to pull up BibleHub.com, all right? Now, yeah, I'm going to read this from a couple of translations because I think you'll see what I'm saying, what, 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 uh, how this, I, I think this will make sense. And I apologize that I'm getting notifications on my iPad. All right, here we go. I always forget to turn off the notifications. All right, here we go. Acts 27.9. Now, listen carefully. Thinking caps on. Let's discern. All right, let's discern so we can make a judgment about how we should handle this text. Is this text saying, hey, that... See, Paul's the Christian, and he just has some supernatural discernment. Now, maybe there's some things that's going to happen later in the text, but at this point, the text really gives us a clue. Here we go. Acts 27, 9. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. 
It was after the day of atonement. The fast that's referring to is after the day of atonement. And that is a specific time of year. And it appears that once that happens, the season changes. And now sailing can become more dangerous because of storms in that area and on those waters. So clearly, this does not require the Holy Spirit. Clearly, this doesn't seem to require any. This seems to simply require some basic knowledge of what happens in the waters in that area after this particular time. That's what it seems to indicate is needed. They do that. So it reaches this point, and then Paul warns them. All right, another translation. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall. Now we're getting an idea. See, this is just a change in season. Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. ESV, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them. Paul perceives the danger. Paul sees it. Now, does Paul perceive the danger? Because he just has, he has some kind of personal knowledge about this area, about what happens in the fall in this particular season. We're we're not given that information. Why why don't the sailors know this? Why don't they understand this? Do Do they understand this or not understand this? I don't know, but Paul warns them. Now, if we go to Acts 27.10, I'm gonna read this from a number of translations. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. New Living Translation. Men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. The ESV saying, sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Men, I can see that our voyage will be filled with disaster and great loss, not only to ship and cargo, but to our own lives as well. Now stop right here. Why does Paul perceive this when the others appear not to? They don't appear to get this. They don't appear to see this. In fact, based off their decision, they're going to ignore the apostle Paul. In fact, let's go. Uh, So he says, so Paul's telling him, hey, this is going to be disastrous. There's going to be loss of cargo, possibly loss of ship, possibly the loss of our own lives also. We we are in danger here, right? It's like one of those Hollywood movies. You've seen this. No, we should go this direction. No, 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 no. If you go that direction, everyone's going to die. We're not listening to you. And then they go and then they're gone. And you're like, well, they should have listened. Okay. It's almost like one of those situations. Hey, I'm telling you, we can't go. He perceives it, they don't. Go to the next verse, verse 11. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. New Living Translation. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. So the centurion had to make a choice. Do I listen to the prisoner Right. Or now as the as the sermon that we listen to, to the minister, do I listen to the minister or do I listen to the pilot and the owner of the ship? Do I listen to the captain and the owner? Who do you listen to? You're you're the centurion. Your job is to make sure Paul gets to where he's going. What what do you do? How do you how do you work this? Right. So so I, I, I you could think from a human standpoint, well, why wouldn't you listen to the experts? Now, here's the question. Why do the experts not see this? Is it because of anything spiritual? Is it because God, do we infer that God has told Paul something? He doesn't say that God had told them. Now, later in the text, he's going to bring, he's going to tell them that God had revealed something to them, but he does not in any way, shape or form indicate that God had told him anything here. So I don't know if we can interpret it that way. What we can interpret it is Paul seemed to understand that at this time of the year, sailing was extremely dangerous. Now you could argue, in fact, let's go back to Acts 26. Um, Okay, and... uh,
Okay, so I think I think here if we go back, yeah, if if we go back in twenty six, we see uh, Paul. We see the the discussion happening with Paul. If, if look at verse thirty two, Agrippa said unto Festus, "This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar, but he had appealed unto Caesar." So then. It was determined that we should sell into Italy, and they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners under the one named Julius Centurion of, August- of Augustus's band. So why would the centurion listen to Paul? I mean, you could argue that Paul may be trying to make some kind of uh, excuse. I, I guess, I mean, I'm trying to, you try to put yourself into the historical narrative. But the bottom line is Paul perceived it. So why? All right. I don't believe that it has to do with anything supernatural here. So what can we learn from this? Let's just try to take a practical lesson. Is it possible? And, and I think that we have, to, we have to at least acknowledge this, that a person's ability to, pers- or to discern is the person's ability to gather and retain information about the world they live in. Paul is able to discern the danger here because he is aware of the world around him. He's aware aware of the world in which he lives. He understands that he knows the season and he seems to know that that season brings storms and that there is danger. Is it is it possible that Christians don't perceive or don't have much discernment because we are ignorant of the world around us? We don't pay attention to it. We don't gather information. We don't retain information. And we just, we just go on with our lives. I mean, I, I, and, and not able to discern. I mean, if you think about a lot of times, I've said it so many times, Christianity is very reactive, not proactive, but reactive because we don't pay any attention to what's going on in the world. And then when all of a sudden, when it, it, it kind of happens, then we're like, oh no, what do we do? What do we do? Why aren't we paying attention before? Why are we not looking at what's going on? I, again, I, gi- I gave you the example, and I have to give the examples that I experienced. I could give many, but I'll just give the one that's most famous to me because it, to this day, I'm just still baffled by it. I heard about the book, The Da Vinci Code, that it was coming out. I heard that the book was going to make some, some very serious claims. And I'm like, okay. So I stood up and told my church, hey, this book is coming out called The Da Vinci Code. You need to buy the book and read it, and we're going to take apart the historical claims that are going to be listed at the front of the book. We're going to address these historical claims. We're going to clarify exactly what happened in church history so that this book will not ta- cause you to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but you yourself can then correct this when you see other people seeing it, because I think it's going to be a big deal, and I, and I literally said, at some point, they will make a movie. Well, guess what? Nobody else in Christianity at the time cared or paid any attention. They ignored it. I remember being, it was a couple of months later, I was at another church and I asked the pastor, what are you going to do about the Da Vinci Code? And he's like, I'm not going to do anything about the Da Vinci Code. I'm like, you're not going to do anything about it? Okay. Well, next thing you know, guess what? A whole world was talking about the Da Vinci Code. Next thing you know, a movie was being made. And next thing you know, Christian ministries were all, all you know, falling over themselves to see if they could get a book published or get a DVD out there to try to address the claims. I'm like, why were we not aware of it prior to? Look at the world around you. Just pay attention. So one, you've got to be able to pay it. Here, Paul just seemed to be, he, he understands the situation. Hey, this time of year, bad storms. Pay attention. Is, is the lack of discernment in American Christianity just because we don't pay attention? All we care about, we, we either, we don't pay attention, or even when we do pay attention, we don't stop to really think about its long-term implications. Is that, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. You can tell me, I, I, I think there's something to that. I think there's something to Christians' lack of discernment is lack of paying attention to what's going on in the world. They're worried about their own lives, just worried about, I don't know, entertainment, fun, activity. I don't know what they're doing, but they don't seem to have a clue. And because sometimes I've been baffled when I'll mention something, even from the pulpit, and then someone will be like, wait, what's going on? Wait, I didn't hear about this. And you're just looking at them like, you didn't hear about it. Do you not have electricity at your house? Do you not have the internet? What have you been doing? And then you'll look and like, well, you were on Facebook for 17 hours posting pictures of what you had for breakfast, supper, lunch, dinner, 
snacks. You posted 37 videos of your kids. Way to go. You're really paying attention to what's going on in the world. But you had no idea that, I don't know, you know, the Twin Towers in New York City are gone. You didn't, I mean, like, you know, you didn't even know the Beatles broke up. I mean, I mean, I know I'm being a little facetious there, but you get the idea. D- 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 were, the, were the people on the boat just that ignorant or they're like, you know what, doesn't matter. We've got to get these people to where the, they need to go. I, I don't know. I just think it's I think it's interesting. So let, let's see what happens. All right, we're at 45 minutes. I think there's a, a lesson right there. I think there's a lesson there. Maybe I could be wrong. All right. So um, and then one more Berean study Bible. But contrary to Paul's advice, the centurion was persuaded by the pilot or the captain and the owner of the ship. Now we go to verse 12. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. There was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. All right. Um, And uh, another translation so we get some idea of what's going on here. And since Fairhavens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix. So because of the situation, there was an exposed harbor, winter was coming, and... um, and it was just a bad place to be. So they, they decided, you know what, we, need to, we just need to continue to sell on it. We, we, if, we, if we stay here, it's probably a bad idea. Um, and they wanted to go further up the coast of Crete and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. So they wanted to go to a better place they thought would be better because it wasn't exposed from the, from the uh, winter conditions and from whatever storm. So, so this sounds like maybe they did realize that this is a bad time. Maybe and say now. Now this I think maybe gives us a little idea. Maybe they did realize, hey, this is a bad time, but we can't stay here. We've got to go somewhere else. So is this a is this a situation where both perceived the same prob, both understood the same problem, but both were looking at different aspects of it. Paul was like, hey, if we sell, this could be bad, and others are like, if we stay. This harbor is not good. We're going to have to go somewhere else. Is that a a situation that they were looking at the same situation, but from different perspectives? Maybe. Possibly. But I know this, you can't have any good discernment if you don't know what's going on, if you don't have a clue. So I think that, that, I think verse 12 is very uh, significant here. Verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw the opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. New Living Translation. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. So they, they're like, okay, here, we've got our chance. We've got, an opera. we've got to go now. If we're going to go, we've got to go right now because we have this south wind that's blowing gently. So supposing they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along the Crete closer to the shore. So Paul's like, hey, wait, this is a bad time to sail. They're like, hey, this is a bad time to go into this harbor because it's exposed. We don't want to be here. We need to get to a safer harbor dealing with the storms and the different things that happen. All right. If you've ever watched The Deadliest Catch, they'll talk about how sometimes coming in to, uh, to, to, into the harbor, into the port there, uh, some conditions make it almost almost dangerous trying to get in. Um, and you'll, you'll watch some of that take place. So like, do we go in or do we stay out? Well, going in is dangerous because we could crash trying to get through this, these rocks to get to the port itself. Well, we, if we stay out, we're exposed to the storm. And, and a lot of people will then, there'll be a debate on which, which decision do you take? And you'll see some of the captains make one decision on the, de- uh, and the deadliest catch is a show that comes on the, the discovery network. I've, I love that show. Don't know why I love it. I just love it. Um, and others will make a decision not to. And it's like, it's very interesting to see. They've, they all have the same information making different things. So again, discernment requires, first and foremost, the information. It requires to know what's going on. All right, so I just think that's interesting. All right, now, verse 14. Before very long, before very long a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. This is Acts 27, 14. I'm reading it from multiple translations. All right. So for very long, a massive storm then breaks out. But uh, but the weather changed abruptly and a wind of a typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. 
But soon, a temp, a, 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 a temp, uh, if I can say the word, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down the land. A tempestuous, there, there's a word, a tempestuous, a Berean study Bible. But it was not long before a cyclone called the Northeaster swept across the, uh, the island. Uh, Berean uh, literal Bible, but not long after there came down from it a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster. Um, the King James, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called, and, and this is uh, how the King James re- refers to this as, an E-U-R-O-C-L-Y-D-O-N, a Euroclidion, all right, or Clydon. I guess a Euroclidon, I guess is what you could refer to it. The other translations call it a Northeaster, but you get the idea. All of a sudden, boom, this, as one says it, um, a, a wind of hurricane force sweeps across the island. It pushes them out. They're trying to stay close to the coast and boom, they're pushed out to sea. All right. And now, uh oh, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Now, Paul told them they could be in trouble. Paul perceived because he understood the situation. Now, others, they, they were looking at something completely different. Well, staying here in this port is not going to work, all right? Verse 15, the ship, the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. Uh, verse, uh, the, another translation, the, sh- the sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. So they couldn't fight against it. They couldn't uh, sail against it. So they're just like, okay, just go with it. Let's just go with it. All right, and they were driven along. So they can't they can't fight against the wind. They just have to go with it. Verse sixteen: As we passed the lee of a small island called uh, Kata, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. New Living Translation: We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Kata, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat, being told behind us. Running under the lee of a small island called Kadia, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. So they have the lifeboat, it appears, behind them, right? And so they get the lifeboat up, you know, up on the ship itself. Now, that, that, that's important because if you're going to be able to, if the, if the larger ship starts falling apart, you need to abandon ship, you have the lifeboat now. So they have the lifeboat available to them that they can get into. That's what it sounds like. That, that would be, they don't want it towing behind the ship, possibly to be get damaged. That's the best I can understand here, right? Verse 17. So the man hoisted it abroad. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid that they would run aground on the sandbars of Citrus. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. New Living Translation. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Citrus off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. So the wind is is driving the ship along. It sounds like they throw the anchors so the anchors will just drag, but it will slow them down so that they won't just go flying into something and crash. They, they basically are losing complete control of the ship and they're just trying to hold it together. It's a, It sounds like a very frightening dangerous situation and they're all trying to figure out what to do and, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're making, they're taking all of these precautions. Verse 18, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they begin to throw the cargo overboard. New Living Translation, the next day as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. ESV, since we were violently, since we were violently storm tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. So they're like, okay, we've got to get weight off this, but let's just start throwing things, throw things off. They start throwing things off. They're doing everything in their power to try to preserve life, protect the ship, keep it from crashing and keep themselves from dying. All right, a, a crazy situation, right? Verse 19, on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. New Living Translation. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. They're, now, three days into this craziness, they're, they're still throwing things overboard. They're just, th- just get it over. Throw it over. Get, we've got we to preserve ourselves. We've got to save ourselves. Right? Verse 20. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. New Living Translation. The terrible storm raged for many days, 
blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. So now they've done everything they can. Now they're thinking it's over. It's, it's, we're not going to be saved. We're not going to be saved. They, they, they pretty much, it sounds like a lot, the, most of the people on the boat are starting to now just come to, to, to they're coming to an, the idea that it's over, that they're not going to be saved. Maybe they're, they're, they're becoming resolved in the fact that they're going to die. It's not a good situation. It's a, it's a frightening situation. And, and you have to really spend some time kind of reading it, trying to let you feel what they're feeling here. Now, again, I don't believe at this point that Paul had any great supernatural um, interpretation. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that he perceived something spiritually. I think he was aware of the seasons and of what was happening. And it appears that everyone was aware that this was a bad time to be, you know, even, even if you're in the harbor, if your harbor was exposed, it wasn't a good place to be. So you needed to be somewhere else and they made the decision. So I think everyone was aware of the situation. They just came to different, different conclusions and different opinions of what to do. And so sometimes discernment is you all have the same information, you have to decide what, how, what, what's the best way, to, what, what's the best decision to, to, to make based off that decision. But I'm going to say it again. For Christians, one of the key elements of discernment is simply knowing what is going on, having all the information, having the correct information. And too many times you see the evangelical church who seems completely unaware of what's happening, clearly unaware of what's developing, and they can't determine where things are going, and they make bad decisions. That's one of the things I say, that as a Christian, you need to know what's going on within Christianity. You need to know what's happening in this denomination and this denomination. We need to know what's going on in the world, because if we're not aware of all of that, then we, can't, we don't know where we're going, we don't know where we're headed, and we cannot make good decisions. So I think there's there's a little bit of that right here. Right? We're almost at an hour. Let's go to Acts 27, 21. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have spread, uh, then you would have spread yourselves this damage. You would have spared yourself this damage and loss. Now, I don't know. I don't know how you interpret that. Uh, that's Paul being very human. Hey, I told you so. I told you so. I, I, you know, it does that, that doesn't come across to me as o- overly godly, but it comes across very human, which I love the Bible. It doesn't take the heroes of scripture and try to make them sound like that they're, they're perfect and that their feet never touched the ground and they never got their hands dirty or bloody. No, they're human beings. And Paul's like, I tried to tell you guys, if you would have listened to me, we wouldn't be in this situation. Now, even there, he doesn't say, hey, if you would have listened to God, he, he doesn't in any way uh, th- throw that in. Uh, New Living Translation, no one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. ESV, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred injury and loss. Now, it could be, you, I mean, again, it's a historical narrative. You don't want to read too much into it, but I know if you go days without food, you can get very gripey and you can start snapping at people. Maybe you just see the, you, you want to see the reality here. Paul's frustrated. They're all frustrated. They're all scared. Verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 22. Here we go. Acts 27, 22. But now I urge you to keep your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Now, Paul, even though he says, hey, you should have listened to me. There's the bad news. You should have listened to me, but you didn't. Now, and so maybe why Paul said this is because he wants them to listen to him now. So maybe what he's doing here, it's not his frustration, maybe. Again, there's a lot of different ways of reading it. It's a historical narrative. Maybe what Paul's doing, like, guys, you remember, you should have listened to me, right? Right? You got that? You should have listened. Look look around you. All right. And they're probably like, yeah, right. We should have listened to you. Good. Now listen to me now. And this is what he wants them to tell you. I urge you to keep your courage. Because not one of you will be lost, but only the ship will be destroyed. New Living Translation. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. 
Now, that's crazy to hear. Hey, none of us are going to die, but the ship is going down. We're in the middle of the ocean in a storm and the ship's going to go down and we're going to live. All right. All right. All right. So how are we, oh, we're going to, we're going to do this in the lifeboat, the lifeboat, the lifeboat's how we're going to do this. The lifeboat's how, so that's what, right? Right, Paul? The, the ESV, you know, I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. Um, and then the King James says, but now I exhort you to be of good cheer for there should be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. So we, so I think now, I think we can kind of interpret the previous statement now, maybe a little differently because it, it comes across first as kind of like, wait, wait, why, why is Paul saying, Hey, I, sh- I told you so. But I think maybe now I, he wanted he wanted to come across almost in a very abrupt way. Look, I told you so. And, and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, he was right. Now, now, okay. If I was right then, listen to me now. None of us are going to die. But I've got some bad news for you. The ship is going down. Now, all right, we, we need the next words. Verse 23. Here we go. Last night... An angel of the, of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood beside me. New Living Translation. For last night, an angel of the, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. ESV. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. Now God steps in. It doesn't sound like the initial perception that Paul had, had anything to do with some supernatural revelation. It was just, he understood the situation. He understood the world around him. He understood the change of season and he understood what happens on those waters. It sounds like the, even the men of the boat had some idea and they realized they could not stay in that port they were at during the winter because it was exposed and that would be bad. Now, you could argue they made the wrong decision. Maybe they were more worried about preserving the boat than they were preserving life. You could, you could argue they were placing the material value of the boat over the, the sanctity of human life. You could make an argument there. You could, you could go all day. But the point is, initially, this is very important, initially, for the Christian, our ability to discern is based off just our knowledge and understanding of what's going on in the world around us. But number two, Second, very key element for a Christian is God's revelation, scripture, scripture. Now, listen, Paul here is visited by an angel of God who gives him a revelation. We believe all of that form of revelation has ceased with the completion of scripture, because if God is speaking to people like that, then the scriptures ultimately are not the final and ultimate authority, which begins to destroy that whole concept. So, I don't believe God reveals himself that way, but we can draw a correlation. What do we need? We need knowledge of what the world around us. We need knowledge of what's going on, but we also need God's word. So your ability to to discern is determined by your knowledge of two things, your knowledge of the world around you and your knowledge of scripture. I will say discernment requires three things, all right? The knowledge of the world around you, you you truly understand what's going on. True knowledge, not false knowledge. Number two, knowledge of scripture. And number three, the ability to rightly interpret it. Now, look what happens here. This is fascinating, all right? Acts 27, 24. And he said, do not be afraid. This, the angel tells him, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God is gracious, graciously giving you the lives of all who sail with you. So he's like, hey, God, an angel of God spoke to me and God has guaranteed that I must stand trial before Caesar. I must tra- stand trial before Caesar. That's why he's in this boat. He's going to Caesar because he appealed to Caesar. Now he's going to Caesar right? He's going there. And the the centurion, you can see why the centurion wouldn't let him go. Because like this guy just trying to get out of going to trial. He just wants an excuse. You can see why. But now he's saying, God is going to keep you and all of the people on this boat. You're you're all going to live. Verse 25. So keep up your courage, men. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. New Living Translation. So take courage, for I believe God will, will be just as he said, right? Now, verse 26. Now, this is where it starts getting interesting. 
Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. New Living a Translation. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. All right, hey guys, we're all going to live. The ship is going down. But what's going to happen is we're going to be shipwrecked on an island. So that's how they're ultimately going to live. They're going to be shipwrecked on an island. So when the when it says the ship is going down, they're not going to be in the middle of the ocean. They're, they're, that's where that's where it must happen. We must we, we must, as it says in one translation, run aground. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. Some says we must do it. Other the New Living tra- Translation said we will be. Uh, King James says, "Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island." So. We, we, there's a lot of different ways of interpreting this, but he's telling them what's going to happen. We're going to crash. We're going to be shipwrecked on an island. Look at verse 27. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the uh, Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. New Living Translation. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the sea of Adria, the sailors since land was near. So, so they, now 14 nights, 14 nights this has been going on, right? I, I don't know how much they trust what Paul said, but they, hey, they didn't listen to him before. So maybe they're listening to him now. 14 days later, verse 28. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. All right, New Living Translation, they dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep, but a little later they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. All right, they, they're taking measurements, realizing, okay, the water is getting more and more shallow, so maybe we're getting closer and closer to land. All right, uh, the King James says, and it sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they found again and found it 15 fathoms. So they know they're getting closer to land. All right. Verse 29. Fearing that they would be dashed upon against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. At, that, at this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. So they don't want to crash against the rocks. They throw out the anchors to try to, to, to stop them from crashing, to try to keep them in, in place. All right, verse 30. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. So, so the sailors are like, okay, look, I don't know what's going on. We got to get off this boat. We got to get off this boat. Let's get the lifeboat down. Let's get out of here. Verse, a new living translation. The sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboats as rough as they were going to put, uh, as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. So they're like, okay, look, Paul, Paul can say whatever he wants. We got to get off this boat. He even said the boat's going down. We got to, and we've got these rocks. We got wind. We got to get off this boat. All right. Verse uh, ESV, again, Acts 27, 30. As the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, he had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. A Berean study Bible. Meanwhile, the sailors attempted to escape from the ship, pretending to lower anchors from the bow, but they let the lifeboat down from the sea. They're trying to get on the, they're, they're trying to get on the boats. They're trying to get on the lifeboats, right? The King James, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under the color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. They've already been putting down anchors, so they wanted to look like we're just going to put down more anchors. All right, all right, get the lifeboat. We got to go. We got to go. Right? Verse 31. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. The, uh, the New Living Translation. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. The ESV, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Right? Um, the Berean Literal Bible. Paul said to the centurion and the ships, unless these men remain in the ship, you are not able to be saved. Right? So he's saying, look, you can't be saved unless they, everyone stays in the boat, which is just an interesting uh, concept. Um, yeah. I, I'm looking here. I'm, I'm reading, reading here uh, what, what's going on here. See, uh, 
I'm looking at some different commentaries. There's some, it's an interesting verse. There's a lot we could take about, uh, t- talk about there, but we've already been an hour. So Paul's like, hey, you, you, this, this, you can't, this is not going to work this way. You can't do it that way. There's a lot of ways of looking at this, but you can't do this way. It's going to require cooperation. If we're all going to be saved, it's going to require we all stick together. All right. Uh, verse 32. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Now that is crazy. Hey, we all have to stay on the boat. We all have to stay. If we're going to be saved, we all have to stay on the boat. This, basically, this is how God told them it was going to work. We all have to stay together. So the soldiers clearly, obviously, trust Paul. Well, he's been right before. They cut the lifeboat. Now, just think about that. They, that's, that's your way of escape, and you just let it go. You just cut it. That sounds crazy, but you're, are you going to trust God? So let's do this. This is very important. Three things, four things for discernment, four things. I just want to throw these quick lessons out there. Oh, there's so much more I would like to get into the text, but I I, I can leave the rest for you. All right, here we go. Four things. Are you ready? Number one, discernment requires you know what's going on. You know, hey, it's it's the season when storms are coming. Hey, this is the area where storms are coming. You have to, you cannot make, have any kind of level of discernment if you just don't pay attention to what's going on in the world around you. You don't pay attention to what's going on within Christianity. You don't pay attention to what's going on inside your own life, your own motives, your own desires, your own thoughts. You have to have knowledge. All right, number two, you cannot have discernment without God's word. You have to know God's word. You got to know it backwards, forwards, left, right, upside down. You got to know it. the, The level of knowledge of scripture determines the level of discernment. If you can't pass simple test on the Bible, then you don't have any discernment. Don't pretend that you do. Number three, it requires not only the knowledge of scripture, but rightly being able to rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to know how to actually study it and actually how to interpret it. And number four, this is very important. You must be willing to follow God's word, no matter how contrary it is to the way you think, or the way the world thinks. They cut the ropes to the lifeboat because Paul said, nope, we're not going to survive. If those men get, it's just interesting. It's almost like God is saying, look, the only way any of you are going to survive, I guess Paul's going to survive no matter what, it appears. But it sounds like everyone else's life, it almost sounds like this. And tell me if you think I'm wrong. The, the only way anybody's going to survive is if they're on the boat with Paul because the promise is that Paul is going to make it to his trial and everyone else's life is only going to be saved if they stay with Paul. If they abandon Paul, they're going to die. The promise is ultimately for Paul and everyone else is, the benef- is uh, benefiting from that promise. I think that's the way to understand that text, which is very interesting. But you have to be willing to trust God's word, even if it means cutting the lifeboat. Hey, the boat's going down. Okay, but we we can't use the lifeboat because we get on the lifeboat, we're going to die. You got to stay with me and we're going to stay on the ship. But the ship is going down. Yeah, that's the way it's going to work. Yes, we're going to run a land and crash onto an island. Yes, but we're going to all live. That seems contrary to maybe their way of thinking and God's ways are not our ways. So if you want biblical discernment, you got to know what's going on. You got to know the scripture. You got to rightly divide the word of truth. And you have to be willing to follow the scripture, no matter how contrary it is to your way of thinking, because it will always be contrary. And I'll stop right there. There you have it. There's far more. Now, what I'm going to do, if first of all, if you go to theologycentral.net, theologycentral.net, You'll, you'll see this series of sermons. You're going to have to look down on the blog. Go, you have to look in the blog section. I've embedded the audio to this series of sermons on discernment, that one that we just kind of listened to at the beginning here. And I'm, I'm going to put the rest of them and have them all there. I would challenge you to listen to them. And then I'm going to do some more preaching on discernment coming up soon because I think it's a very important topic. But we're in an hour and 13 minutes. I apologize. I, I did not want to go that long. But I wanted to really work through Acts 27. And and Acts 27 is one of those passages where, look, I use the King James, but 
uh, to really kind of get a picture of what's going on there, I think multiple translations gives you a good idea of what's going on, on there, right? And there's no major doctrine or anything at play there. It's just a historical narrative. But it's interesting to get an idea of what's happening there. All right. You can tell me what you think about discernment in Acts 27. You can tell me what you think. Um, and, well, I can, I can listen to your dis, you discern what we just looked at. And uh, maybe your discernment's better than mine. By all means, email me at newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. All right. Everyone have a great day. God bless.